your issues, I think we should all be encouraged by. Um, so the objective of this meeting is to harness the problem solving abilities of the environmental peace building community to approach these emergent frontier extractive issues. So I came to this matter from the perspective of a concern with the strange geographies of terrestrial rare earth mining. And in an effort to understand why uh, rare earth minerals, which are not in fact rare, um, in an effort to understand why given their relative ubiquity in the earth's crust, they were mined in, in so few places. Um, I went, I traveled to a number of different parts of the world and in fact spent several years in, in China and Brazil investigating these dynamics. And right around the time that I was investigating this, uh, there were also a lot of investment and policy movement to uh, write new laws in the US in order to make it possible for, uh, to extract minerals from outer space. Now, uh, the whole scarcity myth around rare earth elements and all of that have sort of faded out of the space mining discourse and cooler heads prevail. Uh, most of the discussion is around in situ resource utilization, uh, but really fundamental questions uh, remain here, particularly about the distribution of harms and benefits, about um, uh, compliance of various initiatives with uh, different treaty regimes and other matters that our esteemed panelists will share with you today. So in order to explore the multiple dimensions of the accelerating movement to mine in outer space, to be clear, no mining is actually currently happening. Um, we have today uh, three wonderful speakers, uh, George Sowers, uh, Cassandra Steer, and Temedayo Onioshun, uh, who I will uh, uh, introduce in turn. Uh, so just a couple of housekeeping matters. If you have a question, feel free uh, to pop it into the chat. Uh, I will moderate them. And so even if uh, due to time constraints, we're not able to highlight your question and put it in front of the panelists, I, I think it's safe to say that the entire community benefits from seeing it and knowing that it's there. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'd like to first in, uh, invite our first panelist, uh, Dr. George Sowers, who is a professor in the Space Resources Program at Colorado School of Mines. Um, he has 30 years of experience in the space transportation field um, and has worked with for Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, and the United Launch Alliance. Um, and he recently retired from his position as Vice President and Chief Science Scientist of United Launch Alliance, where his team developed an architecture for fully reusable in-space stages fueled by propellant that's mined, refined, and distributed in space. Uh, so here to help us uh, wrap our head around uh, this emergent field and its technologies is Dr. Sowers. Dr. Sowers, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Julie. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I do have a few slides. I always find things are easier with, with pictures, especially when you're talking about space. Uh, space pictures are cool. Space is cool. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that. All right. Uh, yes, good. You got it, okay. So I'm gonna just provide a quick overview of some of the potential for resources from space. Um, so resources just in the inner solar system are nearly infinite compared to those available on Earth. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the power output of the sun is 10 trillion times the power consumption of all humans on Earth today. And just one large metallic asteroid like 16 Psyche, which is out in the main asteroid belt, uh, can supply human needs for metals for millions of years at current consumption rates. Um, but probably for the near term, the resource that's likely to be viable economically is water. Um, but if we can harness space resources, um, in my opinion, that will enable the next great economic revolution. And so just to remind you a little bit of human history and economic revolutions that have preceded us, uh, the first re uh, revolution was the agricultural around 10,000 years ago. Um, and that enabled humans to increase their energy capture, which is you know, a decent proxy for prosperity by almost an order of magnitude and enabled civilization empires in a lot hugely increased population but it also brought you know its own problems things like disease and pollution 
uh, just 300 years ago, there was the Industrial Revolution. Um, due to the abundance and low cost of fossil fuels, another order of magnitude in energy capture was achieved, um, gave rise to basically everything we enjoy in the modern world. Um, space resources will be that next revolution and has the potential to, for a, yet another order of magnitude or more increase in prosperity, uh, has the potential to be able to fix a lot of Earth's problems and fundamentally, if you look out far enough, it has the potential to eliminate scarcity entirely. So that's kind of the uh, kind of the potential. The overarching goal: bring those resources uh, within the economics uh, purview of humans. Um, the system, the most effective system ever created for harnessing resources and generating wealth and prosperity, is the free market. It brings things like competition, innovation, efficiency, which all lead to growth. Uh, the free market is aimed at consumers. Um, and since right now all consumers live on Earth, the place that this economic revolution will begin is in the vicinity of Earth in the area that we call cislunar space. That's the area uh, between and around uh, the Earth-Moon system. Um, so likely the, the uh, first resource that will be economically viable to exploit is water. Um, it turns out water is ubiquitous in the inner solar system. It's, of all things, uh, at the poles of Mercury, that close to the sun. Uh, we now know that water is very abundant on Mars. Uh, we can find water in near-Earth asteroids, uh, chemically bound into the minerals. Um, but for the short term, the most important location are the poles of the moon. Um, if we have water, we know it's essential for life. It contains oxygen for breathing air, it makes a great radiation shielding, um, but we can also split it into oxygen and hydrogen and then liquefy it into liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen rocket propellants, the most efficient chemical propellants known. Uh, we can also use it directly as propellant in the form of steam or plasma. So I'm fond of saying that water is the oil of space. So this is a snapshot of what, you know, in the next maybe 15 to 20 years, the, uh, the uh, water economy in cislunar space might look like. You have the Earth and Earth orbits, low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit. You have the moon on the right-hand side. And you have this point in between that's called EML1, which stands for the Earth Moon Lagrange point number one. It's basically the uh, point between the Earth and the Moon where the gravity of the two bodies balances. Uh, that's a great location for, um, for a logistics distribution node because you can access pretty much any Earth orbit or any location on the Moon from that one location. So I envision uh, we'll be mining water on the surface of the moon, refining it into propellant. Uh, we'll also be mining water from near Earth asteroids, um, bringing that water to EML1, refining it into propellant. Uh, that water will be used to service satellites in geosynchronous orbit, uh, which will provide you know, unprecedented levels of maneuverability and sustainability for geosynchronous satellites. Uh, it will also be used to refuel rockets on their way uphill out of Earth's gravity well on the way to other locations, which uh, dramatically reduces the cost of all space transportation. So that essentially solves one of the big problems that uh, economic problems that impedes the development of space, which is transportation cost. Um, so where could this potentially go in the, in the, in the longer term? Well, if we develop the resources of the men uh, that could enable the, the creation of large space megastructures, for example, like this uh, space solar power satellite. Um, it's an enormous object, uh, maybe 13 by six kilometers, this particular architecture, 10,000 metric tons if launched from Earth. Um, but if we can source the materials on the moon, the cost to move materials from the surface of the moon into geosynchronous orbit where you'd want this thing to be, um, is an order of magnitude less. And so this brings the potential of space solar power. 
It eliminates a lot of the problems with terrestrial solar power. Uh, you have sunlight available 24 seven, um, unmitigated by the Earth's atmosphere. You don't have day night cycles. You don't have weather. Um, essentially, uh, you have access to unlimited, completely green energy for the entire Earth um, for the foreseeable future or until the sun burns out, which is, will be billions of years in the future. So on that hopeful note, um, I look forward to questions. Hey, great, thank you. Thank you, George, thanks for that presentation. Um, so a number of people are coming to the question of space mining from different different perspectives and and different levels of experience. So that's um, so that presentation was certainly helpful for helping us understand, um, you know, where we are, what the possibilities are in the near term, and um, certainly a, 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 an approach to utilizing resources in space and for the benefit of uh, certain groups on Earth. Um, there are a number of unresolved. Uh, uh, legal and treaty matters currently surrounding this. And we're in this moment, I think now, you know, the past, the past few years and unfolding over the next couple of years, we're really the mode of human engagement with outer space. It's currently being defined, right? This is a really critical time. Um, and so in order to help us understand uh, the, the legal and the political questions surrounding this, um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Dr. Cassandra Steer, who is joining us from Australia, where she is a mission specialist with the Australian National University Institute of Space and a senior lecturer at the College of Law. And she specializes in space law, space security, and international law. Now, Dr. Steer has more than a decade of international experience uh, teaching at universities across the world. Uh, she's also formerly the acting executive director at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Ethics and Rule of Law, uh, where her major focus was the design and delivery of a uh, international conference on the weaponization of outer space, exploring ethical and legal boundaries. Uh, previously, she's held positions as the Executive Director of Women in International Security Canada and the Executive Director of the McGill Institute of Air and Space Law, among others. All right, so uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Steer, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak and also for accommodating my time zone because I realize this would have been scheduled at a different time, but I am grateful to <laughs> it's my early morning. Um, so I um, thank you so much also Dr. Sellers for that presentation. There's some pieces that I'm going to problematize about that. Um, in particular, um, and the fact that Julie's expertise is in these frontier economies and extractivism is what uh, is the reason she and I connected. Um, because what we're seeing uh, as we're moving into these kinds of activities, so we're not yet mining in space, but we are very nearly there. And the race to the moon is absolutely on right now. So I'm sure you've all heard about NASA's Artemis program to return astronauts to the moon for the first time since the 1970s with the first woman on the moon and also to start mining the moon. Um, and there are select countries by invitation only who can be part of that. So Australia has been invited to be part of that. Um, and Russia and China have signed a memorandum of understanding um, which which is basically their parallel efforts to get to the moon and start mining as well. Uh, and it also involves commercial entities because that is where the innovations are and the technologies are in space today. It is, it is very much a commercialized uh, economy, a commercialized um, uh, political space as well. So companies like SpaceX, um, Blue Origin, um, you know, th there are many, many, but those are the ones that everybody knows. They have, um, far more financial wherewithal and a much um, higher risk profile. And they don't have to answer to, to the public. They're not spending public taxpayers' money. So they are pushing the boundaries of technology rapidly. And they are also pushing the boundaries of the law. They are lobbying for the laws to be changed in their favor so that they can continue to innovate, but also so that they can really push against any limitations against what might be possible in space. And so what we're seeing, in fact, is um, a repeat of the history of extractivism and colonialism in the sense that um, it, it's always been colonial companies, uh, excuse me, it's always been companies um, and industry who have 
you know, gone out and explored uh, on behalf of empires um, to claim territories and to start mining resources to bring the wealth back to those countries. So this is why I said I'm problematizing a little bit of, of what George Sowers presented in his excellent presentation. Um, so it's not happening yet, but we're also not talking about science fiction in a few hundred years. We're talking about what's going to be happening in the next decade. Um, and the reason why, uh, and I agree with Julia, that we're in, a, we're in an absolutely formative moment in history in terms of our rapid um, and, it, and it exciting movement to explore space more and the excitement that's behind that, um, but also the contention. So our legal framework for space comes from the Cold War era. We had the Soviets and the Americans competing with each other for um, political and ideological and technological dominance on Earth. And they had started testing uh, weapons in space. They had started observing each other's um, nuclear programs in particular from space. So um, satellites have had a military purpose right from the start. And there was a bit of a race to try and dominate space. Very quickly, they realized that um, in particular, their weapons tests were impacting their own satellites, their ally satellites. And so they realized they needed to come up with some ground rules. Both the Soviets and the Americans understood what, what they were doing was restraining the other more than themselves. Um, but that's what gave birth to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Um, so all of the post-World War II allies in, signed on to that enthusiastically and were part of the negotiations. Uh, and it got rapid near universal um, participation by states around, around the world. And it really is we're going to see that as a kind of constitution for activities in outer space. It sets down general principles and values that were about restraining um, a conflict from entering into space um, and ensuring that everyone has continued access to space. So it doesn't regulate specific behaviors. It doesn't regulate commercial entities, for instance. But what it says is in Article 1, that space is the province of all humankind, or all mankind, or the province of all humankind, that all states have a right of access to space and use of, um, and use of space, and that all our activities in space should be for the benefit of all states, all countries, regardless of their economic uh, status or development. Article two of the Outer Space Treaty says that there is no national appropriation in space by means of sovereignty, use, occupation, or any other means. So that was the rule that was that was agreed upon to prevent land grabs, to prevent one country becoming uh, an owner and a dominator of this incredibly important strategic um, domain. Uh, so the US and China have both planted flags on the moon that is purely symbolic. Um, so there is no national appropriation. No one can own anything in space. Um, there are various other um, articles which are important as well, but those are the ones I want to highlight. What we've seen um, in this century and in the last decade or so is and because it's becoming more commercialized, because of this desire to open up the economy that, that Dr. Salas just took us through, and in particular, if we want to have long-term human habitation, so space stations uh, and eventually um, lunar habitations and, and potentially Mars habitations, we need water and we need resources for fuel. We, the, we just need those. So it's not really about bringing these things back to Earth. I would actually put space-based solar power in a different category. I think that's something we absolutely need to see happening, but it's not an extractivist industry, whereas mining resources from, for example, the moon or uh, asteroids uh, is. So what, we, what has started to happen, I mentioned that these commercial entities have been, particularly in the US system where um, commercial entities can lobby government very effectively for laws to be put in place. In fact, many of the commercial space entities were influential in writing um, a, a new piece of legislation in 2015. So that was under the Obama administration called the Space Competitiveness Act. And in that act, there's a provision that says that essentially mining shall take place in outer space is in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty, which is the whole contention. And that any American citizen, which of course under US law includes companies, um, will have a right of first access, will be protected by the US if any other company or country wants to land where they have landed, and has, has the right to extract, use, transport, and sell any resource uh, in space. 
Um, and the question is, is that even possible given that Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty prohibits national appropriation? So there are many who would say that the US was giving away a property right that it itself didn't have. And there have been a lot of debates in international space law around this. Um, so this, the US can legislate whatever it wants in domestic law, but if that is in breach of the Outer Space Treaty, um, we have a problem, we have, we have a point of conflict. Um, uh, speaking of which, I also wanted to come back to another comment that you made, Dr. Sowers, that um, uh, if water is the oil of space, if you think about it, oil is exactly the resource that has led to global conflict historically and very much so in the 20th and 21st century. So we need to keep our eyes on that because water is going to be become the resource around um, tension points rise and, and most likely conflicts uh, in space, which are going to impact us dramatically because of how um, how dependent we are on space for our daily lives, navigation, communications, banking, trade, weather, climate, you name it, there's a space system involved in what we're doing. Um, so this Space Competitiveness Act, um, Luxembourg also legislated something quite similar because it wanted to um, encourage foreign companies to register themselves in Luxembourg uh, so that they could undertake these kinds of activities. There's been a bit of a pushback, but what we also saw in 2020, at the beginning of the year, there was a presidential executive order signed by Trump, which stated the US does not consider space to be a global commons. Now that's not a legal term of art. We don't see that in any treaties, but it is a term that is used, um, uh, I guess you could say politically to describe, the, to describe what I said is in article one of the Outer Space Treaty, everyone has a right of access and a right to use space. So it was a bit of an inflammatory position to take We'll have to see whether the Biden administration is going to explicitly walk back on that. Um, but it also said in that executive order that the US wants nothing to do with the, um, the moon agreement, which is the fifth of five core space treaties we have. So I've only spoken about the ice, outer space treaty. The moon agreement only has 18 countries. So it is really not seen as a very successful international regime. The core principle of that treaty, uh, you have about two minutes left. Sorry to interrupt. Two minutes. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder. The core principle of that treaty was that at such a time that these kind of mining technologies appear to be feasible, an international legal regime has to be established. And the idea was it would mirror a little bit of what happens uh, with the deep seabed mining. Um, but only 18 countries have signed. Australia is one of them. The other countries are countries like Morocco, Peru, the Philippines. So not hard hitters politically and not big players in, in space. Um, uh, so, and off the back of that, the US introduced the Artemis Accords last year, which only seven countries have signed. And those accords have to do with who's gonna take part in the Artemis program. One of the provisions of those accords says, mining in space shall take place is in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and, uh, and countries who sign on to this have to agree to that. So we're seeing, a, we're seeing these developments because they need to happen, because these activities will take place. But what we're also seeing is a lot of nervousness internationally. There is starting to be a push from within the United Nations uh, Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. There have been various um, civil society initiatives uh, and independent initiatives like the Hague Working Group to try and come up with what should a legal regime look like to regulate these activities, to ensure that we can still support the commercial industry, but we can ensure that everyone is going to have access. We can ensure that there isn't going to be undesirable um, environmental impacts on the lunar surface, for instance, and that we can try and rein in those effects, those historical effects of, um, of frontier colonialism if we are going to be undertaking these activities. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for the extra minute, Julie. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really uh, helpful perspective and a way to think about um, how exactly we go about governing ourselves, right, as a as a global community, uh, as we extend our extractive ex activities beyond our atmosphere. Um, now, one of the things that um, that I've noted as a fairly fairly salient feature of the discussions around space mining and space policy is that um, is that while the conversation is very vibrant, um, the perspectives tend to hail from a few specific geographies, right? Uh, primarily from uh, from the Euro-American and Australian world, and um, 
And as a result, we can end up missing a lot of the really important uh, thought and work that's happening in other parts of the world um, in English as well as in other languages. Um, and so that, um, and so in order to help address that and move the dialogue more broadly toward a global uh, direction, uh, it's my pleasure to introdu introduce uh, Temadayo Onioshun, our third panelist. Uh, he is a space scientist and an entrepreneur and the founder of Space in Africa, which is the foremost news reporting and forecasting agency for all matters pertaining to the space sector on uh, the African continent. Now he's the former regional coordinator for the Space Generation Advisory Council for Africa. Uh, he's been listed uh, as one of the one of the world 24 under 24 leaders and innovators in space and STEAM by the Mars generation. And he also received 35 under 35 Space Industry Recognition Award by the International Institute of Space Commerce. Um, in June of last year, he was selected as part of the inaugural, inaugural Carmen Fellowships Program. And the, the Carmen Fellows are considered to be change makers and global leaders who are shaping the future in space. Uh, he's currently pursuing a PhD in geography and spatial sciences here at the University of Delaware, uh, where he's thinking uh, uh, deeply and carefully about all these various issues that we have. Uh, before us today from multiple perspectives. And so uh, without further ado, uh, Temadayo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Tinga. Um, I will be speaking from a different perspective and I will also be posting more questions than answers. Um, today's space industry is built on international collaborations, obviously. Um, and since we've been able to commercialize space, we have realized that it is essential for nations to work together to build and sustain values. So whether it is satellite communication, navigation, air observation, or human space flights, no country is actually an island. Uh, and there's no reason why this should be different as we explore how to utilize space resources. Uh, the space industry is one of those industries where the technologies that we develop and our operations actually have repercussions, um, just like the oil industry. Uh, which is interesting because Dr. Soas just compared water in space to oil. Um, and we all know what oil actually did for our environment. So we must not wait for the future before we start addressing some of these problems. In trying to capitalize on space technologies and the abundant resources available in space, we are creating and we will be creating more jobs. So how do we ensure international collaborations in addressing this? The space industry is enticing now. It's growing very fast. Uh, VCs are throwing money at the technology. Uh, and in the past couple of weeks, several new space companies have also decided to go public, which is an indicator of the growth in the industry. So how do we develop an international corporation that actually works for space resource utilization? International space treaties have not been very effective in addressing some of these issues. So whether it is the Hard Space Treaty or the Moon Treaty, um, Miami satellites currently stranded on the International Space Station due to a military coup is a striking example of real world geopolitics splitting into space. And as we explore several business opportunities around space resource mining, uh, if we're not careful, the problems that we're creating and the ones that we create would actually make it difficult for us. So maybe it's time to advocate for an update in international space treaty. Or better still, instead of advocating for you know, international space treaties that has actually not quite worked fine, um, maybe it's time for us to advocate for national space policies that are actually reasonable. There is a saying that if the government finds drugs on my land, it belongs to me. But if they find minerals on my land, it belongs to the government. Uh, this is the way it works in a lot of countries. And as Dr. Steers earlier mentioned, thanks to the Space Act of 2015, uh, the legislation in the US now gives US space firms the right to hone and sell natural resources they mine from bodies in space, including Astor, uh, which is inconsistent with international space treaties. As we know, minerals um, mined in space could also damage the environment around the heart and eventually lead to conflict over resources. So how do we address issues like this? Uh, currently, we're worried about junks that we're creating from all the satellites that we're launching. 
Uh, but very soon, the time by the time we delve into space resource mining, the problem will become more significant. So for a few minutes, I'll focus a bit on how we can actually use space taxation to address some of the species. Um, in 2015, Joseph Pelton in his paper, Possible Institutional and Financial Arrangements for Active Removal of Orbital Space Debris, proposed a space debris removal fund equivalent to 5% of the total cost of space mission. His idea is that this can be implemented at national or regional level. Uh, and the goal is to address space debris issues. He also proposed that this fund can be managed by an institution like the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs or a new international space convention. Um, and this brings so many questions. For example, in the current dispensation, are we going to be taxing manufacturing? Or are we going to be taxing the launches? Uh, Bryce Space Tech, they reported in 2019 that the launch service industry was worth $4.9 billion and the satellite manufacturing industry was worth $12.5 billion. So if we follow Pelton's you know, proposal, 5% tax on both manufacturing and launch would worth about $870 million. This is way more than the total early stage investment that was raised by space companies in 2019. So maybe 5% is too much. So maybe 1% is good. Um, Jeffrey is an American investment bank and financial service company. They estimated in 2018 that six rocket companies generated $8 billion. A 1% taxation on the revenue uh, will ensure $80 million is set aside for research and development into um, debris removal. So maybe we should extend the same thing to the resources that we're bringing to hurt from space. Um, we're in a formative period, just like Dr. Steers mentioned. The global space industry is reportedly worth about $400 billion. So is the industry ripe enough to develop taxing mechanisms now? And will it ever be ripe enough? Uh, should we develop taxations right now? Or should we wait another 10 or 50 years until when space resources lead to another economic revolution? Just like Dr. Soares earlier mentioned. Uh, in comparison, the total market cap of Bitcoin in February 2021 was about $1 trillion. And this is for a technology that was created in 2009. Uh, the space industry, space technologies have been around for several decades, and it's still worth just around $400 billion. So is the industry, is it worth a lot now? Is this a good time to introduce policies around taxation in order to address some of the problems uh, that would arise from resource mining, or should we wait uh, a bit into the future? Or better still, instead of getting some of these companies or institutions that are exploring um, you know, mining operations, what if we get government to actually pay these taxes on the behalf? Uh, a lot of countries now are implementing policies to encourage commercial space activities. So governments can actually see this as one of the ways to support their operation. So instead of these companies paying the taxes, maybe the government can actually pay it on the behalf. And instead of paying it to organizations like the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, maybe we can ask each country to collect these taxes and use them to fund research and development in their countries to address some of the problems that we're facing in space and the ones that we'll face in the future. Historically, nations and private institutions have always worked together to explore space resources. Um, so they need to have the same energy in order to address the problem that actually come with uh, this resource utilization. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that thought provoking set of, of questions and propositions. Um, one of the really important things that uh, that I think communities like this can offer are uh, a, a generative set of concrete propositions for how we actually move forward together um, in a constructive way, in an inclusive way, and in a way that fosters uh, innovation and collaboration. And so um, I'm delighted to see a vibrant, dis uh, vibrant discussions already unfold unfolding in the chat. Uh, while other people are gathering their ideas, I'd like to uh, pose a question uh, to each of the panelists, and this is a fairly simple one. Um, as far as um, 
updating our international governance with respect to mining in outer space. Um, I wonder if in your, your view, we should work with uh, existing uh, treaty instruments and institutions, or uh, if we should uh, focus on developing uh, some other uh, multilateral or international initiative entirely. And we'll just go in the order of the speakers, if you don't mind, uh, George. So, you know, I, I may be the the outlier in, in this in this group here. You know, I, I'm very supportive of the approach that the US has taken uh, with domestic law that grants property rights to resources extracted in space. Um, you know, there, it, it's tough to think about regulating something that hasn't even happened yet. And I think there's a, a time and place to, to do that once we understand what the problems really are. Um, <clears throat> you know, before, before you understand what the problems are, then, you know, any regulatory activity is, is just going to inhibit uh, the establishment of, a, of, a, of the field. Um, you know, that being said, there have been working groups. Uh, the Hague has, has sponsored a working group looking at a framework um, for potential, you know, future international uh, regulation and governance for space resource activities, which, you know, it, it's got some common sense principles that, that eventually could work. Um, I think, I don't think anything that the U.S. is currently doing is, is counter to what the Hague came up with. Um, but I think it's probably going to be countries leading the way, eventually forming bilateral, multilateral, you know, agreements, and then eventually that gets codified into more of an international regime. That's the way I see it happening anyway. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, George. Cassandra? So, um... George, I I, um, I know that I said that I would problematize what you what you laid out and um, uh, and 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 we've we've both done that I guess a little bit, but I also want to highlight that this doesn't mean to say that um, you know I don't support a, a space mining industry at all. In fact, I do. My concern as an international lawyer is that we regulate it in such a way that we are ensuring access to and benefit from those activities globally so that we don't repeat what has happened with extractivism on, on Earth. Um, and so the, so I just put a link now in the chat of the, the Hague Working Group. There's a UN document that refers to it. But if you just Google Hague Working Group, you'll see various documents discussing what kind of framework they've been working on for several years. Um, and I think what we're going to need to see for space governance in general, but particularly for this kind of activity, is a new hybrid form of governance where we have countries, international organizations, be that the UN or something that's more specific set up for it, and those commercial entities, all part of that governance structure. So coming up with the rules together, because you need industry to come up with rules that are going to support the commercial activities and support uh, innovation and not be harpered by, you know, just over-regulation, but you also need the more um, neutral internationalist perspective. Um, and you also need the countries with their interests. So we need all of those interests together. We're going to see a hybrid model emerging, which is a great thing. The other thing is that when industry um, and the, the most um, pertinent actors are part of coming up with the rules, they're more likely to adhere to them because they they came up with them. They, you know, it's like when you work with, in a classroom and say, what are our ground rules going to be for the semester? When the students come up with those rules themselves, they then want to adhere to them. Um, so that's what we're going to see. And um, I think I think the other thing is that um, you know, we really need to be wary of um, nationalist approach to this kind of thing. Um, we need to ensure that the Outer Space Treaty, some people say it's a bit outdated, it's from the 1960s, but it remains our constitution and it's what's kept space stable. Um, we're, we're, at, we're at a cusp of seeing a conflict in space. We're on the cusp of seeing these kind of, um, these kind of contentious legal issues pushing us into greater geopolitical competition. And everything that happens in space is simply an extension of geopolitics in another domain. It's not a different set of issues or a different set of um, competitions. It's the same stuff again in a new technological domain. Um, so we just need to keep our, 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 excuse me, our eye on those kinds of issues. Great, thank you for that, Cassandra. Uh, Temadaya. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Soros. I, I think 
it's good to see a lot of companies building business cases around resource mining. Um, and if we come up with some hard policies, it's just going to discourage them. So we need them to build this business case. We need them to grow to a reasonable extent. Uh, but then in doing this, we need to uh, be careful that we're not um, setting up standards today that we will not be able to change tomorrow. Uh, so this is important. And at the same time, I think a lot of companies, uh, they respect the national laws more than they respect international treaties. So maybe if there's a way we can develop framework around this where um, you know, national laws and international treaties are sort of like on the same page, uh, I think this would be useful. Excellent, thank you so much, Temedayo. Um, and related to this question, and if I can draw on some of the themes of the questions that, that have come up in the chat, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of the concerns among the scientific community uh, have to do with uh, how, uh, what uh, the move of private sector operations into uh, space and the space mining domain, how that might change the face of international scientific cooperation, including access to data uh, and information. Um, yeah, of course, you know, for, for those of us in academia, we're very well familiar with, with the struggles around uh, the financial models of various academic journals and things like this. And there are larger debates about, uh, you know, whether uh, publicly funded research should be publicly available or hidden behind a paywall. And so building on the point that, uh, you know, that our, our issues on earth uh, certainly travel with us to outer space, I wonder um, if, if I could ask each of the panelists to put forth a vision, right, for what uh, scientific, international scientific cooperation might look like uh, in a space uh, mineral prospecting or mining scenario. Um, and I guess we'll proceed in the same order if you're if you're ready to take that one, George. Yeah, no, I right. I, th I think uh, yeah. Once there's an economic reason to you know understand these terrestrial bod or celestial bodies in more detail, then I think that does nothing but but help science. It provides a, a, an actual economic motivation. Um, you know, the Colorado School of Mines we educate you know, hundreds of geologists and graduate hundreds of geologists every year, only a few of them do academic science. Most of them go to work in the oil and gas field supporting, you know, oil and gas exploration or mineral exploration. You know, I think the similar thing is gonna be, gonna be seen here where, you know, it, it, it'll actually be a, a boom to science to, to, to have an economic purpose and have somebody else to pay for it besides besides, you know, ever more competitive government grants um, and, and vice versa. I mean, the, you know, the economic side needs the science, you know, in order to develop technologies to extract resources from asteroids, we need to understand the science of asteroids um, and the same for the moon and Mars. So I think there's a very synergistic benefit um, between science and the economic purpose of extraction and development. Thank you, George. Um, Cassandra? Sorry, yes. Yeah, I mean, that, exactly that, that symbiotic relationship this week between science, commerce, uh, and politics, right? And it, it's, a, it's a constant um, um, tension, but also interaction between these different worlds. Um, so I guess the, the vision um, would be that hybrid governance that I mentioned, which would include um, representatives of the scientific community as well, because one of the other things we have to keep in mind is uh, environmental protection, planetary protection, you know, what's going to happen to the lunar surface once we start putting more robots there, mining resources and having human habitations, what's going to happen to the orbits of the moon, are we going to fill them with just as much uh, debris as we have filled out our Earth orbits, because that's, that is going to cause a huge problem as well. So we need to have all of that kind of input in there as well. We do have a lot of historical evidence that there is great scientific cooperation, even at politically tense times. So throughout the most tense moments of the Cold War, um, there were times when various US administrations shut down all kinds of communication and information sharing with the Soviets, but um, particularly in space, in the space programs, the scientists in the space agencies still were talking to each other and sharing what they were learning. We also have the International Space Station where you have 
um, you know, the Russians, the US, European countries, Japan and Canada, all working together. So although I said what happens in space is just an extension of geopolitics on Earth, we also have an example of where cooperation is possible when scientific endeavors really are at the forefront. So we, we have some good evidence that we can do great stuff when we cooperate and that having the scientific community involved in governance is really important. Um, the other, the other thing I would point to in terms of a vision, I'm a huge fan of the National Geographic mockumentary series that's just called Mars, where they have a series of documentary interviews with experts, and then they have a fictional storyline of the first human settlers on Mars playing out the issues that these experts have talked about. And there they have that, in that fictional storyline, they have that hybrid governance model in place where you have shareholders, countries, international organizations, and scientists all trying to figure out how to go about governing these new human activities together. Great, thank you for recommending that. Um, Temadayo. Uh, thank you. Uh, for me, the, the vision is that we, we need to come up with uh, plans that would actually avoid uh, resource conflict. Um, you know, wherever it is like economic values, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about space finance. Economic value uh, could, you know, easily translate to conflict over the resources. So it's important that we come up with some plans, um, you know, whether this would be developed uh, from the academic perspective or the industry perspective. Uh, but this needs to be developed in order to avoid it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and now I wonder as we're as we're wrapping up here, um, I wonder if I uh, could invite each of our panelists to you know give a thirty to sixty second parting thought, and also um, if in the final minutes as we get close to the end of the hour, if uh, if there are any uh, publications that are readily available uh, that people could follow up with if they're interested, if you could uh, put a link to those in the chat. Uh, I think that would that would uh, benefit our audience and benefit our our thinking on these on these issues and these really important insights that you've all shared with us beyond the the hour that we have here together today. Um, all right. So parting thought, George. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, you know, thank you for the invitation to this. It's uh, been very interesting. It's a, definitely a different audience uh, than the one I normally speak to. Normally, I speak to the uh, the converted. Um, you know, space mining proponents, and we're all thinking about how we're going to go make this happen, right? And, uh, uh, you know, one message I'll leave you with is that it's, uh, and Cassandra said it uh, in her talk, this is closer than you think. Space mining is no longer, you know, science fiction. Um, there are programs in place as part of the, 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 uh, the NASA programs, the Chinese are looking at resources, there are rovers that will go to uh, the moon in the next uh, year or two that will actually start looking and prospecting for water ice. Um, NASA's investing in technologies. Uh, there's a big boon in private companies that are interested in, in these resources, um, including the two richest people in the world, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, um, are laser focused on helping develop these resources for the benefit of all mankind. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you know, the, the vision is abundance reduces conflict. You know, there's conflict when there's scarcity of resources, bringing the nearly infinite resources of, the, of space into the economic purview should reduce conflict um, because of that basic fact. Um, we don't even know how to think about a, a post-scarcity world, but it's one that has a lot less conflict, at least in my imagination. All right. Thank you, George. Cassandra? Mm -hmm. I, I love that vision, George. Unfortunately, I'm a little bit more dystopian where I see the competition for access to these resources, um, particularly when it's driven by the two richest men in the world who have a profit margin in mind as much as they do any other greater vision because they run companies. Um, I, I actually see this as a potential point of conflict for us. Um, and I don't see the current model bringing the benefit to all humankind at all. Um, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of, of history to show that 
um, when it's driven by social, certain commercial entities for the benefit of certain states, empires, historically states today, um, that those benefits don't get distributed. So the, the distribution of harm versus benefit that, that Julie mentioned, I think we're now seeing uh, repeated uh, or, or about to be repeated in space. And that's where my concerns are. Um, but, but I don't think, I said I'm more dystopian, but I do also harbor hope in the sense of that hybrid governance is going to be our solution. Um, if we want to move into the 21st century um, um, as, as the human species and doing these amazing things, we need to figure out collaboration at a much higher level. Okay, excellent parting thought. Temadayo. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start from the statement that abundance uh, reduces conflict. Um, I, I don't think we're experiencing that presently on Earth, um, and I, I don't personally agree that you know all these countries and commercial entities that they are mining these resources or they're exploring these resources for the benefit of all mankind. I, I don't think so. I think I think it's for their economic benefit. Um, and I think as we are working to develop framework, to develop policies around this, it's important for us to really understand this, to know that, um, you know, an Elon Musk mission is not for all mankind. It's, you know, it's for his own benefit. And if, if a country like the US, for example, is developing policies to say that, oh, if you're a private company, you go mine resources and you bring it to the heart that it belongs to you. I don't see how that is for the benefits of all mankind, that is to their benefit. And, you know, it's sort of like put a lot of countries, you know, in the back seat. A lot of countries that are not, maybe they're not technologically advanced or they're not looking at exploring these resources. They're not benefiting from this. And it's important for us to have some sort of inclusive framework, you know, that um, puts all of this put in perspective. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. I think I think as we move forward, um, I think that we will benefit but if we continue to uh, lay our interests on the table, right, in the spirit of open dialogue and uh, moving toward greater international collaboration to do things better than we did them in the 20th century. 20th century was a marvelous time. It was also a terrible and bloody time. And so here's to hoping that, uh, that we can do things better moving forward. So thank you so much uh, to our panelists for sharing your time and your insights with us today. Uh, here to deliver uh, closing remarks is uh, Dr. Erica Weinthal, who is a professor of environmental policy at the Duke University School of the Environment. And she's also the vice president of the Environmental Peace Building Association, which is uh, our co-sponsor for uh, this symposium today. All right, uh, Erica. Thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you, Salim, too, for both um, hosting this event as part of the Road to Geneva, which I will say a few words about in a second. But also, um, thank you to the three presenters. Um, I teach global environmental politics and have not spent a lot of time teaching about the politics of space. So this was really informative and enlightening and just for me highlighted the um, relevance of this subject matter for the Environmental Peace Building Association, both as a source of potential conflict and potential peace, um, but also um, the necessity for really looking at governance mechanisms, which really um, in many ways undergirds a lot of what we do at, um, in the environmental peace building field as you know, governance essentially is something that um, you know, is essential to all forms of natural resource management. When it, um, and so let me just say a few words to conclude about the association and the road to Geneva. Um, the Environmental Peace Building Association is a relatively new association. Um, it was established in 2018. Um, and it has come about through the work of many different um, scholars, practitioners over the last few decades. Um, Salim has been, um, you know, has played a critical role in building out the field of environmental peace building. Um, and it brings together as um, researchers, practitioners, decision makers to work on all areas of environment, conflict, and peace. Um, we have 
over 400 members um, and 20 plus institutional members across the globe. Um, I would say probably in a 70 countries or so. And we have a number of activities. I'd invite you to look at our website, environmentalpeacebuilding.org, um, which lays out a lot of what we do. Um, everything from receiving a bi-weekly um, environmental peace building update newsletter. We have um, developed a MOOC on environmental peace building in collaboration with other institutions, including um, the Environmental Law Institute and um, UN Environment. Um, we are, as, um, are in the process of developing a journal on environment and security. And we have different interest groups where people can, um, within the association can come together and work on specific issues. So we have a water interest group, a gender interest group, um, and who knows, we may have one on deep sea, you know, on frontier minerals at some point in the future. Um, but what this event is part of this road to Geneva because our next, um, our second conference will be in Geneva in um, February, of um, 2022. And because everything has been online this year, we decided that we would use this as an opportunity to have a broader process that would be more, that can engage a broader community um, and decision, you know, practitioners, decision makers to um, highlight different issues that would be relevant as we move towards this conference. And so we've been holding events. Um, you know, from August of last year up until May of this year that have been co-sponsored with host institutions. We've had events on Colombia and peace building um, on the Middle East, this event on frontier minerals. And we hope that many of you will be interested in joining the association, but more importantly in participating in the conference and abstracts, the call for abstracts are, is now open. And if you go to the website, you, will, you can find all the information on the second international conference on environmental peace building. It is being co-hosted by the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and it will be a hybrid event. We're hoping for in-person, but also online. Um, and so with that, I wanna thank again, Salim and Julie for hosting such a wonderful event. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Erica and Carl uh, for supporting this effort through the association. Uh, please keep in touch, uh, all of you who participated uh, I think we've had a really diverse audience. We had people from industry, uh, from academia, from civil society. So we will keep in touch. Uh, all best wishes, uh, wherever you are, stay safe, take care, bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Um, thanks to our panelists and thanks to our audience. All right. Thank you.